here we are yet again for the yearly top five list because life said I can't play video games this year so I only have five games for the list this year and to make up for this I will try to go into more details of, about the games that I have in years past now let's get into the rules only games I first played in 2021 can count for the list no remakes, remasters, or ports of games I've already played, so despite Pokemon Diamond getting a full remake, it doesn't count for the list. Same goes for Ghost of Tsushima that got a new version and some new DLC in the form of the Isle of Iki. And regarding the first play this year rule, my friend would be pissed if I didn't at least mention Ace Combat 7. But he forced me to play its multiplayer for a bit, so it can't count for the list either. Sorry man. But without any further ado, let's get this show on the road with number 5. Do you remember that one Pokemon Presents that announced a bunch of Pokemon stuff like Pokemon Teeth, I think, and Detective Pikachu for Switch? Was that cancelled? Or have we just not heard anything about them in years? Or was it a fever dream of mine? I don't I don't fully remember. Well, one thing I heard from this press conference was a Pokemon MOBA called Pokemon Unite. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of MOBA games like Dota 2, League of Legends, and Heroes of the Storm, but I have played Heroes of the Storm before. And Pokemon Unite, and my main problem with MOBAs is, is my own playstyle. I like to play a bit more recklessly than most, and I often end up dying with me just having to wait till I can play again. Now I understand why it's made this way, it's n just not to my liking. Now that being said, it's not like I don't enjoy MOBA sometimes either. In Heroes of the Storm with Murky, as long as I had his home base, uh, his respawn was 3 seconds, if I remember correctly and Pokemon Unite at least feels like it has a lower respawn time than other MOBAs, at least in the early game. Or I just like Pokemon too much to notice. Now Pokemon is a great idea for a game with a large cast of playable characters, so you're almost guaranteed to have one of your favorite Pokemon in the roster. Like for me, I like the melee Pokemon like Talonflame and Garchomp back when I did play Pokemon Unite because yes, I fell off of it just as fast as most people did. Now, I know people still enjoy Pokemon Unite, and it has some great looking costumes, but the microtransactions are some bullshit. For how much one costume can cost now, I don't think it's a pay to win game, but it's still not a good look. The reason Pokemon Unite is so low is that a game I don't normally play mixed with how fast I drop the game, so it was just a recipe for disaster for me. We live in an age where a computer can have a terabyte of RAM, as long as you can afford it, yet we don't have space travel, that's affordable, but what we haven't found, yet, is a virus that can take over living things and use their host memories to do whatever it needs to survive. Here's hoping COVID doesn't do, do that. And if you give the virus a bounty hunter's most powerful weapons, because for some fucking reason her suit, she uses an organic power suit, it becomes a, a very powerful SAX in Metroid Fusion. Metroid Fusion is the fourth and for the longest time the last mainline Metroid game until Dread came out this year. As a side note, Dread isn't on the list due to me not having played much of it as I write this, and even as I record this I haven't played much more but it's a very fun game so far, so back to Fusion. For once, Samus is not on an alien planet, but this time is on the BSL Space Station, which is a nice change of place from places like SR388 or Planet Zebes. I would say that if the ex-gummies haven't turned every th organic thing on the station into uh, something that will kill you. And as I mentioned earlier, Samus herself was even infected by the ex-gummies. The sole reason she was saved is because of the baby Metroid from Super. The DNA from the baby was turned into a vaccine for Samus, so she became the natural enemy of the X-Gummies. 
However, because of the vaccine and the SAX, Samus is in the weakest and squishiest state she has ever been in. Samus will die so easily, even at endgame. However, sometimes it feels fair, not always. There were a few bosses that gave me some shit. Uh, some that come to mind are Nightmare, the SAX, and the security bot. Also, who the fuck thought it was a good idea to make the security bot biomechanical? As a side note, if the first phase takes so long that I forget there's a second phase, there's a problem. Yes! Fuck, I forgot it had an X parasite! This is the first Metroid game that is mostly linear with exploration. You're told where to go and you just need to figure out how to get there. And even certain areas are blocked off entirely at certain points in the game, with the SAX trying to destroy data centers so Samus doesn't get any more powerful. On the topic of exploration, it is very different from every other Metroid game I've played so thus far, but it also makes it very beginner friendly, so people can use this as a jumping off point into the Metroid series. Not my personal favorite, but it's still pretty good. Hyrule Warriors was an interesting game, taking parts of some of the best Zelda games for one big crossover, but I never thought we would get a new Hyrule Warriors game. But setting it before the events of the Great Calamity was the best choice in my opinion. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity takes place a hundred years before Breath of the Wild, so we get to see more of the champions whose souls we saved, and how they act more than we did in Breath of the Wild. And we get to see the alternative timeline because a little guardian named Terrakal decided to travel to the past before the Great Calamity and then later brought the new champions to help save the day. How? Not sure. As a side note, I also never realized before this, uh, someone pointed out uh, <laughs> that the uh, new champions are new champions. I just thought they were representatives of the race, which kind of is what the champions are. The gameplay on a base level feels like the first Hyrule Warriors game, yet I didn't feel like this one was a grind to play through. However, I didn't enjoy playing a fair bit of the cast. I mainly played as Link or Impa, with some other characters I liked being most of the first set of champions, Sidon and Zelda after she gets the bow. Everyone else I didn't like as much, with my least favorite being Reiju. I cannot control any of the attacks well. She has a wide range of attack, but only what hits her sand seal or her counts for damage. Which when you're dealing with a large group of enemies isn't as much of an issue. When you're dealing with one however, it's a little bit more of an issue. Overall I did enjoy Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity and I do hope we see another Warriors game at some point. Hopefully with a bit more canonicity, but uh, at this point I'm good with whatever. So, it's been a bit since I last talked about Persona 5. No? Well, too bad, because we got Persona 5 Strikers. Here we have another fancy hack and slash game on my list. I don't normally enjoy these games. That seems to be a running theme this year. I'm only now realizing this as I record this. What the fuck? But Zelda and now Persona 5 always get me to play and for what they are they are very different from each other where Zelda is just flashy combat but is fun to do, Strikers is well just as flashy but has a lot more strategy involved on who you have on your team as you can have the best team to fight against a boss or a team of waifus that was the worst idea to do on a boss rematch when none of them have the boss's weakness. Yay for me thinking of this joke ahead of time. The story is a sequel to Vanilla Persona 5, so you won't be seeing any characters from Royal, but you also won't really miss them as the new characters like Sophia and Zenkichi, they feel like they belong in the world and both have fulfilling story arcs. Speaking of the story, we are set in the summer of Japan. Now, Japan's summer for students is just over a month, and the game story takes most of it, so... You don't really have a time limit this time like Persona 5 does, but I also think it would have been a bit too punishing if it was included. The aforementioned bosses can be very fun and creative, from a BDSM Alice in Wonderland parody 
to a killer thinking he's a superhero. One of these things is a bit less creative, but most of the bosses and the fights are very creative with different things to keep in mind at all times. I will say that I kept forgetting that this game is called Persona 5 Strikers, because even when writing this, I had scramble till about halfway through writing this. Maybe I'm just an idiot. Over the last year, I've been getting more into streaming on Twitch, plug, 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 and part of the reason is to help me play through my quite large backlog. Now, one of the things I've noticed as I've streamed is I've had speedrunners of the games hop into chat to help me out. It happened when I streamed Bioshock Infinite, and it, and I've had it happen a lot when I streamed one of the most speedrun games ever made, Super Metroid. Super Metroid is a game I've only heard good things about, and after playing it, I can see why. The game is so thought out that anything you can do has some reason for it, be it an upgrade or boss to fight, which funny enough, I was able to beat all but one boss on my first try. Thanks for ruining that, Kraid. One of the best parts is how open it is, and to most players, that could be too much for them. But as long as I can think of something to do, I don't get frustrated. And Super Metroid is one of the only games I can think of that has been able to keep me thinking on what to do. And help from a speedrunner or five helps a bit. By the way, shout out to Ambrew, Stove, and Samus from my Twitch chat for helping me get items I might not have gotten otherwise. As an SNES game, Super Metroid was made to be played on, well, an SNES controller. So with the SNES Classic, I did the, just that and it was quite fun to do so. Basically, long story short, Super Metroid is one of the best games I've played. It is very fun to play and I can see why it became a classic and a fan favorite to speedrun. I just hope I don't fall into the pit of speedrunning like Ambrew, Samus, and Stoff have. I don't want to have to learn Sex Master. And that is my list. Thank you so much for watching this video and making it to the end. Uh, I really got nothing else to say, in all honesty. 2021 has been an interesting year for me and I think everyone else at this point. So I'm just going to keep this brief and I'll say catch you guys on the flip side. Later.